Amen. All right, my message today is contending for prophecy part three. Contending for prophecy part three. Subtitle, Consistent Prayer. Amen. Last week I shared about it is written. And when I shared about written or it is written, that means when you want to overcome the challenges in your life over the prophecy, the, the promises that God has given to you, it's going to take, it is written, to overcome the obstacles in what God has said to you. And so the basis of how we begin to uh, combat or to fight or to contend over our prophecy is it, it is written. It is written, meaning it is what God has said in His Word. And so it's important for us as believers to make sure that, number one, that we have the Word of God in our life daily. Because if we do not have, we'll become victim. And so I shared last week that prophecy, it is when God speaks to us. It is when God declares something to us in His Word or God speak to us through the Holy Spirit. And so we also share that every prophecy that God speaks to us, it requires our, our obedience, meaning there is a condition to every prophecy. So if you fulfill your part, you played your part to obedience, then prophecy will come to pass. But even though prophecy may be guaranteed from God, you still have to contend. You have to be a contender in order to see prophecy because prophecy invites Satan in our life. Prophecy is a gateway for hell to come over our life to destroy us. And so today I want to share to you about how to contend for prophecy through prayer, consistent prayer. But before we do that, let me explain to you the importance of prophecy. Why is it important that we receive prophecy? What is the meaning? What is the purpose of prophecy? But what's the importance of prophecy? Number one, prophecy. If you're writing, when we receive prophecy from God, prophecy forces God to act on our behalf. The moment God comes and says something, it actually forces himself to come on our behalf or to act on our behalf. So if God says you're going to be blessed this year, then prophecy will force God to come and make sure that you're blessed this year. This is the power of prophecy. So we need to obtain prophecy so that God can act on our behalf. If you have not received a prophecy, then the God cannot act on your behalf. But the good thing is that if I, the pastor, have not prophesied to you, if anybody has not prophesied to you, you have the written word to become your prophecy that you can force God to act. I want God to act on my behalf. So we need prophecy. Number two, why is it important for prophecy? Prophecy awakens the believer to hear God's word. So every time God prophesy to you, it is actually God speaking to you. It awakens you to hear His voice. It awakens the believer. Every believer needs to hear that God knows something about them, is concerned about them, is, in, is, in, uh, is watching over them, is desperately, madly in love with them, that He wants to do something to them. And so prophecy awakens us to hear what? The Word of God, the voice of God. The importance of prophecy. Number three, prophecy proclaim God's word publicly. That's why prophets always prophesy. Why? Because when God speaks to us, most of the time the manifestation of what God wants to do in our life is not just private, it's actually public. So when God blesses you or prophesies to you in the, pub, in, in the privacy of your room, then God will make sure also He prophesied to you in the public because people around you need to know that God is concerned about you. So prophecy proclaims that God's word is proclaimed outside publicly. So that's why 
we encourage people, especially in counter night, don't miss encounter night, or even the healing service that's coming out, that we're trusting God that the gift of the Spirit or the gift of prophecy will be activated in our life so that we can prophesy to each other. So, the importance of prophecy, it proclaims God's Word publicly. Number four, prophecy releases the power of the Holy Spirit. So every time your prophecy is given, there is power available to validate the Word, to validate that which God has said to you. So if God said that this year is your year of breakthrough, you have to understand there is a power enough to make sure your breakthrough comes. That is the power of prophecy. But regardless of the importance of prophecy, we as believers, we need to know, we need to contend for our prophecy. Acts chapter 12 verse 1 to 5. And we're going to understand the contention of Peter's life. I'm sure I shared to you in the first week that Peter set and demanded from God to test Peter. And so I want us to learn. Get your pen and paper or keep up with me in the scripture as you're reading. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 5, Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Verse 3, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded farther to size Peter also. This is already a message. King Herod is already in uh, he has a plan to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. That is talking of King Herod is a typical image of Satan himself. Satan has an agenda against the church. And so King Herod is a typical shadow of Satan. And King Herod said he will go um, and, and proceed further to Peter. Why? Because he killed number one, James. James was one of the leaders of the apostles during the time. But then you have to understand when Satan knows there is a prophecy over your life, Satan will not just watch over your life just to watch. He proceeded what? Further. Come and say further. Every time you get an attack, Satan will not just stop at one attack. He will proceed what? further. He will take another attempt. He may attack you in your health. He may attack you in your children. He may attack you with your friends. He will not just stop at one stage. He will proceed what? Further. So Satan came, according to this scripture from King Herod, he proceeded further to size Peter. Peter is you and I today. We are Peter. Why are we Peter? The Bible says it was during the days of the unleavened bread. Verse 3. I mean, verse 4. So when he had arrested him, arrested Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him. The, the word four squads, meaning uh, four times four. So there were 16 uh, soldiers guiding over Peter. And then he says, intending, intending what? To bring him before the people after the Passover, meaning he wanted to really put this guy in prison after the Passover, the feast, the day of uh, Passover. Verse 5, look at what happened here. This is our message. The Bible says, verse 5, Peter was there for kept in prison, but what, come and say it with me together, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? By the church. So you can see from this message, we know Peter. Every one of us know Peter. Peter was the one apostle who said to Jesus, when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? That's like many of us today, Jesus is asking, who do you say that I am? Many of us say Jesus is just a miracle worker. Maybe Jesus is a breadwinner. Maybe Jesus is a deliverer. But Peter said, no, 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 he's not Elijah. He's not Moses. He's not someone else to come. But you are Christ. That's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 12 to 19. I'm not going to read that scripture. 
So Peter, we can understand the moment he said to Christ that you are Christ, the son of the living God. The Bible say that God, uh, Jesus Christ prophesied. Jesus Christ spoke to Peter. What did he say to Peter? The Bible says that Jesus prophesied to Peter of his identity because for you are Peter. His name was called Cephas, meaning he was a shaken reed, meaning Peter was a doubter. So you can see the names of a person. Peter was a doubter. But when Jesus, he identified Jesus as the Christ, Jesus said, Peter, you're no longer a shaken reed. You're no longer a doubter. You're no longer moved by the wind. You are now called Peter. What is Peter? The rock. Meaning now you are the rock. Your identity has been given. You have a new name. And so Peter's identity did not just end there. The Bible says, then God proceeded further and began to speak that you have a purpose that upon this church, I will build my what? My house, my church. And he says, upon the house of God, that the, I will, um, the gates of hell will not prevail. Meaning Peter received identity, Peter received purpose, Peter received what? Assignment. Three things Peter received. That's what prophecy will do. Each one of us have a prophecy of identity, prophecy of purpose, prophecy of mission. But within that prophecy, Satan understands the meaning of that prophecy. So Satan, when he heard the prophecy of a Peter's life, the Bible says Peter became automatically the leaders of the apostles. When he became the leaders of the apostles, Jesus says through you, the apostles, that the church will be built through. And as a result, that the gates of hell shall not prevail over the church. We are the church. The foundation of the church is built by the apostles, the 12 apostles. And then the Bible says, from that moment, from the same scripture here, Peter, uh, the Bible said Herod went further. This was all acts of Satan. I'm trying to connect the dot to you. This were all acts of Satan. Therefore, Satan heard of his defeat because Peter's identity brought victory. Peter's purpose brought victory. People, uh, Peter's uh, assignment brought victory. And that victory means the defeat to Satan. And so Satan was contending over the prophecy of purpose, a mission, and an identity. And so each one of us have a purpose, an identity, and a mission, which it becomes our prophecy. The Bible says on, from that moment on, we can see Peter's life. Peter's life begin to become a, a rocky one. Peter will begin to be used by Satan himself to challenge Jesus. Sometimes he will say to Jesus, you're not going to die. Sometimes he said to, to Jesus, you know, I cannot go over these waters. I cannot walk over the waters. So you can see Satan was actually acting behind Peter to destroy Peter's life. What is the message? The message is this. Satan began to intensify his attack upon Peter's life because of the prophecy he received. So the moment you receive a prophecy, the attack will intensify. It will not just be one attack. It may be two attack, it may be three attack, but it will be consistent attack for a very long time because until your identity is destroyed, until your mission is destroyed, until your assignment is destroyed, Satan will never give up. He will contend over your prophecy. But what you must do, what you must do, you must engage in consistent prayer. The Bible says that the church hurt. This is why I like the church. You should be thankful for the church. Because some of us here, that you go through a problem, but the church is praying for you. You know, people, you're going through a situation, but the church is praying for you. And so you have to understand that if prayer is not made, some of us are surviving because of the prayer of the church. Some of us are still living today is because of the prayer of the church. And so Peter could, was in prison but the, the, the intention of Peter was that at the end of his prison, he was going to die. Because Satan wants to destroy him. So you have to understand that your prophecy will be attacked. 
And you must use the weapon of contention called consistent prayer. And so last week we say it is written. Let me just give you a disclaimer. You cannot master one element of your life to experience victory. You may experience victory, it is written, but then Satan will challenge you eventually into a place that you need to get into prayer. And so today I want to teach you the second element, prayer. Come and say, I will pray. I will pray. It is only those who pray, then they will resist the attack of Satan. Your prayers are weapons that goes before you and acts as a shield, acts as a magnet against the forces of the enemy upon your prophecy. But you, if you don't pray, then you'll have a lot of issues. Prayer. Prayer. Let's look at Luke chapter 18, verse 1. It says, Men always ought to what? And Come on, say the last part. And not lose heart. Let me just focus on the losing heart. Many of us pray one time and we lose immediately. Many people, when they pray, they think prayer is just to deal with that situation at once and that's it. But the Bible said the church pray con what? Constant or consistent. So that means you cannot pray for one thing only. You have to pray and pray and pray until there is a victory. You cannot pray for one minute and expect a result immediately. You may not pray for two weeks and expect a miracle immediately. Sometime you need to be praying and praying. And so the victory for Peter is because the church prayed. And so the victory in your life was because you will be praying. So if I do not pray, then the Satan has an advantage, has an age to overcome my prophecy. That's why many of us, we don't see the prophecy come to pass. We, we, we complain, we complain, we complain, we complain, but not knowing that you did not do your part of what? Prayer. Say, I will pray. So he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray. I like the word. He did not give you an option. He says what? Always ought to pray. So it's not when you don't, when you feel like it, you pray. It's not when the doctor says the report, then when you pray. It's not when the pastor says you should pray. It's not when, when, when everything is going wrong in your life, then you should pray. He said you must always pray. So it's your prayer that is consistent that brings the resistance. It is your prayer of consistent that brings your victory. Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. I like this one. Come on, let's read together. Pray without, it did not say stop. It said pray without ceasing. Meaning if you're not a prayerful person that you're giving an advantage, you're giving a door. Your, your prayerlessness is an empty door for Satan to come through. Your prayerlessness is an opportunity for Satan to come through. Your prayerlessness is an invitation for Satan. So every time you're not praying, you are giving a little door for Satan to come through. Pray without ceasing. Men always ought to pray, and now he said, pray without ceasing. You know, prayer, I'm going to define prayer, and how do we engage in this prayer? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 as well. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Yeah, leave verse 18 only. Verse eight, 18. Look what it says. It says, praying always with what? All prayers. Just keep that there. Praying always. The key word is I want us to understand all to pray. Always praying. And not, I mean, praying without ceasing. This is the element of prayer. That you cannot pray because it is a seasonal thing. You pray because it's a demand that you must live by. Prayer is like the air that you breathe. Prayer is like the food that you eat. Prayer is like the water that you drink. If you do not pray, you suffocate. If you do not pray, you thirst. 
If you do not pray, you get hungry. And if you do not pray, you in fact open doors for demonic agenda. So prayer is not just for pastors. Come on, tell me. Prayer is not for pastors. There's some people here, our pastor will pray for me. No, prayer is not for pastors. Prayer is not for the worship team only. Prayer is not for the intercessory group only. Prayer is not for your little groups only at, uh, uh, out of the church. Prayer is for everyone. Come on, say prayer is for every. If Jesus can pray, who are you not to pray? Jesus consistently prayed. The Bible says he'll wake up early in the morning. Do you know that the early morning of Jesus is 3 a.m. in the morning? Oh, for our, some of us here sleep until what? 1 p.m. Some of us, I don't know if you have a life, but I hope you have a life. I hope you have a life. If you wake up at 1 p.m., I hope you have a life. <laughs> or maybe night shift. <laughs> we, can, we can excuse you if night shift. <laughs> but <laughs> what I want to say is that you don't just... Jesus was working up early intentionally. Some of us can do gym exercise intentionally, but we cannot pray intentionally. Some of us can, can, can have our group chat intentionally, but we will not have prayer intentionally. Some of us only pray in groups, but never pray with ourselves. So he did not say pray with group. He said men always ought to pray. It's, it's you. It's you. He did not say groups should pray at 3 a.m. Groups should pray at 9 p.m. Groups should pray at 7 p.m. He should say men always ought to pray. The Christian work, as much as it's corporate, is still personal. You got to personalize your prayer. That's why for me, I said I will never join a group or do anything with people if I can't do it myself. Because what I'm doing, I'm just, I'm just floating by, <laughs> hiding by. No, if you want to use it for motivation, that's good. But after a while, you need to be by yourself. So, prayer is for Everyone. You know, like musicians, they don't want to pray. They just leave that to intercession. Worshippers, they not leave that to the pastor. On the congregation, leave that to the pastors or those who are very holy and spiritual only. Oh, no, 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 no. Prayer is not for holy or spiritual people. Prayer is for human, humanity, human being. As long as you're a human being, you can pray. You can talk, can you? Tell me, can you talk or not talk? Everyone can talk. That means you can pray. If you can talk, some of us can talk to our friends for an hour, but we can't talk to God for an hour. Some of us can talk to our, our spouse for like three hours, but we can't talk to God for two hours. Some of us can talk to our, our, about our problem to our pastor, but we can't talk to God, our problems to our God himself. Prayer is about having that time with God alone. I'm challenging you for good so that you can go and pray. First thing I always ask people, have you prayed sometimes? Have you dealt with that issue? Because if you, then the Bible says, then you can call an elder afterwards. Because you've done what? Your own prayer. So, what is prayer? Or, or, or why should we use prayer? What is prayer? And why should we use prayer? You know, prayer is not just communication. As much as it is communication. But when it's to deal with your destiny, it's more than a communication. It's about a warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I want you to, to listen to the tone of these verses that I'm reading to you. It says, finally, my brethren, be what? Be strong. Why would it be strong? Because there has to be a battle, isn't it? There has to be a battle. There has to be a challenge. And it says, in what? In the power of his might. Not in your power, because none of us have power. We don't at all. Verse 11, it says, but put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the what? The wheels of the devil. The word wheels is means strategy. So there is the strategy of Satan. So Satan has a strategy over your prophecy. Satan has a strategy over your prophecy. And then verse 12 says, for we wrestle. That means a believer has to wrestle. Prayer is a place of what? 
wrestling. You, you need to become a wrestler in prayer. Oh my God, you need to become a wrestler in prayer. You have to. <laughs> you need to become a wrestler. And I like this. It says you do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. That means it's not about your brother and your sister. It's not about your pastor and someone else. It's not about your, your leader not leading you right. It's not about your choir leader not teaching you right. It's not about the pastor not giving you instruction. It's not about your father not giving you good in instruction. It says, but against principalities. Against what? Powers. And against the rulers of darkness of this world. And against spiritual wickedness. There are wicked things over your destiny. There's an enemy in high places. But this is what we must do. Verse 13. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And one of the armor is prayer. Or the platform for using prayer. Or using the weapons. He says that ye may be able to what? To withstand the evil day. The evil day referring to the, in, in our context right now, our message right now, the evil day against our prophecy. Because some of us here, God spoke to us many years ago, but we're not seeing the result. Some of us, God began to speak to us this year, but we're not seeing the result. But these are the evil days. He says, having done all and to stand, therefore, or stand therefore, having your loins girded with truth, one of the weapons, and having the breastplate of righteousness, second weapon, and third, and your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel. Number four, putting all, um, above all, taking the shield of faith. Number six, were ye able to stand and quench all the fairy darts of the devil, and the hel um, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, Number six, which is the word of God. Number seven, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching unto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The key word here is perseverance. When you pray, you have to persevere in your prayer. You got to pray. You may pray for two months. You may pray for three months, but you got to pray. You got to pray. So what is prayer? Prayer is a place of establishing your victory. Prayer is a place of establishing your victory in Christ. The key word is in Christ. Come and say in Christ. You see, when you go in prayer, you don't use um, things that are not in Christ. You use those things that are in Christ. Because whatever is in Christ, it is already finished. Come and say it is finished. So whenever you get into prayer, you find that way it is finished in Christ concerning that which God has for you and that the devil is trying to take away from you. And so when the devil comes to you against your prophecy, all you have to do and find out in the word of God where it is written and then you begin to use what is written in prayer. Your it is written is needed in prayer. You need to now establish your words of Christ in prayer. How do you do that? You do that by declaring and proclaiming it is written over the voice, number one, the voice of the enemy. The voice that tried to bring confusion. The voice that tried to bring delayment. The voice that's trying to afflict or attack you. You need to declare. To declare is to speak over it in prayer. You stand as a watchman and you say, I cannot let the gates of hell come over my family. This word that God has said, it is, it is for, indeed for real. And so Satan, you cannot come against that word that God has for me. You begin to proclaim things in prayer. You need to use your proclamations, your declaration. This is why you, when you pray, you can never pray silent. I don't understand people praying silent. No, you have to utter it out. You got to speak it up. Prayer is not silent. You don't go, no, you're not Hannah anymore. Hannah used to do that. And the people begin to say she was drunk. But now you are in the Holy Ghost. You are not, you're not drunk in the Holy Ghost. So you can express your drunkness. 
you can express your drunkness now because you're not in the Old Testament, you're now in the New Testament. And so what I'm trying to say to you, you got to use your words. You speak loud. You speak to your enemy. Confront your enemies by the truth that is in Christ. By the truth that is in Christ. So prayer is a platform or a place that you use that. Number two, prayer is a place of wrestling against the devil's scheme and the strategies over your life. How do you do that? By fighting from the standpoint of victory. All right? So when you go in prayer, you don't, you're not praying to, to receive victory. You are establishing the victory. Because when Jesus said it is finished, that means everything in your life is already done. So all you're doing in prayer, you're not praying that and God, you know, maybe through my prayer I will receive victory. No, you're already a winner. Then you're enforcing your winning capacity to the devil that is coming against you. God already said that you're blessed. So the Bible said that God will not change his mind. So what you need to do when you're in prayer, you say, this is what God has said. And so no matter what you try to do in my life, it will not come to pass. So I've already received that which you're trying to fight against me. I'm teaching this with passion because this is important. This is really important. You have to f pray from the point of victory. You know, when you talk from the point of a, a loser, what do you do? You, you, you don't express your, 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 your full confidence, your full boldness. It is only when you are now uh, from the point of victory, you can declare things from, with boldness. So you can sit to certain. I remember one apostle many years ago. I think it was Smith Wigglesworth or A.A. A. Allen. And so he was, in, uh, he was sleeping. And while he was sleeping in his room, and then a wind came and the wind blew his bed to the other side. Imagine that. <laughs> and some of us go tsunami or whatever, hurricane immediately came to my room. So this guy's bed was shipped from this place to another. You know what? He, he got up, he looked up, he said, something is fishy. Why am I, how did I get there? So he said, whoever you are, whoever pushed me, to this place, I command you to push me back. Ah, I love that. I love that. So he declared, in the name of Jesus, take me back to where I belong. And I love it. Another wind came. <laughs> Took him back. He said, this is my victory in Christ. And Satan has no power over it. So you need to know when you get in prayer, you can declare things from the point of victory. Not from the point that I will get the victory. It's already, I got it. I got it. I got it. Number three of prayer. Prayer is about enforcing the finished work of Jesus over anything that, over any opposition against my prophecy. Let me repeat that again. Prayer is about enforcing the finished work of Jesus over anything or opposition that comes against my prophecy. Anything. Anything. The devil is no exemption. Your friends is no exemption. The doctor's report is no exemption. The wind is no exemption. The storm is no exemption. You got to enforce the finished work of Jesus. Enforce it. Enforce it. Number four. Prayer is a place of resisting. Come and say resisting. The attacks or the arsenal of Satan against our prophecy. So you have to resist. Satan is an enemy that will not quit. He's not a quitter. People say Satan is a loser, but he's not a loser. Because the guy never quits. Losers quit. I'm telling you, that guy is not a loser at all. If someone says Satan is a loser, you have not read your Bible. And you have not looked at your life. Because Satan is attacking you non-stop. The Bible says he's like a lion rowing, waiting, right? And for opportunity to just take over. So that guy never quits. He never quits. So if Satan never quits, why should you quit? Don't quit. Don't quit over your prophecy. This uh, last week, so I went to my, my, my book. I have a book of prophecies and dreams. So I decided to go look into all my prophecies. 
I write prophecies. Everyone who prophesies over my life, I write down. I sometimes forget the dates, sometimes I put the dates. And so I write down the prophecies. And every time here and there, I go look at, did it come to pass? And then in fact, I look down to encourage myself of what God is saying. And one of the reasons, uh, next week I'll probably share the, the importance of the power behind encouragement. I mean, uh, prophecies, what does it do to you? And so I was looking, I was looking at my prophecies. And, and so I have an entire book and it was hiding for some time. And I didn't even know my wife put it in her room. She was enjoying it, reading over my prophecies. And so you have to understand that prophecies is so important. And so you need to begin to dot down your prophecies, write down your prophecies. Many years ago, um, people were prophesying over my life like many before. Like Sister Linda wrote, oh, Sister Linda, I met a couple of times. You know what she was doing? Sending me prophecies about me. And all of them came to pass. Now, I knew, so I, I, I read over it, over my prophecies. I have pastors that write Speak to me. They call me and said, you know, I see this, I see this. Like this morning, I read over one of the prophecies. It says, there is a time coming that God is going to take you through a process and He's going to accelerate you very quickly and you receive your, your ministry. And so, but before you can do that, um, um, enjoy the times that is God slow with you. Wow, that encouraged me. So that means before God began to accelerate me, I needed to build the slower time is the place of foundation. So when my foundation is right, so when God accelerates me in that season, that is to come, my foundation is very solid. I was like, my God, I, I love these kind of prophecies. So what does it do? It does something within you. And so, but the key here is this. Every year I sit there and I put down my, my book down. God, masubra. Lord, you said it in your word that you prophesy to me. That this year is my year of this. God, I do not care what the enemy wants to do or say against my prophecy. Lord, I believe that you bring it to pass. You said that this year you're going to send a couple of people to this ministry. Lord, make sure that prophecy comes to pass. I don't care what the enemy wants to do. Lord, you said it. I, I receive prophecies after prophecies. And so I write down my prophecy, but I pray. Oh, people of God, you need to pray. You need to pray. And let me give you three ways to pray. The number one way of prayer is praying in the Spirit. Because praying in the Spirit is when you lose all your grammars and English on what to say, you know, God will just speak on your behalf. Because sometimes we repeat our prayer thank you, na, 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 all the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, cover my family, cover my brother, cover my sister, cover my brother, cover my sister, cover my brother, cover my sister. Amen. Cover my sister, cover my brother. Amen. We're constantly doing that. But when you go in prayer, it's a new language now. God is praying on your behalf. And so you may not see what Satan is going to do tomorrow. But when you pray in the Spirit, your prayer is sending messages to tomorrow. Your prayer is preparing you for tomorrow. Your praying in the Spirit is covering you for tomorrow. What the enemy wants to do. I remember me and my spiritual mom, we were in prayer. And when we were praying, she began to say to me, Son, I see something. I see that you've been in, invited in many conferences and you were going from one place, but Satan has a plan to destroy you in your troubles. So every time you travel, Satan wants to bring chaos in your problem. And that week, I'm telling you, not kidding, that week I was driving my car, it's straight forward, just in a lane like this, someone drove from the other side straight to me to try to hit me. And that's not just one. And then again, another one came, wanted to just do that to me and came out of the way. So do you think that's just coincidence? Somebody just decided to play games with Sam? <laughs> Let me just tease Sam, you know? Maybe pastor is bored. Let me wake up pastor. You know, get, get up pastor from his boredness. He's probably tired. No, no, no. That is certain. That is certain. And so I, I, I watch over every time, even when I'm tired, I, I become very alert when I'm tired because I know that is an opportunity for Satan to come and do something into my life because Satan wants your prophecy not to come to pass oh when we were beginning this church oh Satan began to bring so much problem to this ministry and he's still doing it and he will keep doing it and we're not giving up we will pray on Wednesdays 
We'll pray on Wednesdays. We'll pray our life every week. We'll pray. We'll pray. So I want us to pray right now. I want us to pray. Three prayer points I want us to pray. I want you to pray from your heart. Today I want to teach you to pray. Number one, a, a way, if you know how to speak in tongues, I want you to, to walk around in your place and just speak in tongues. And if you do not know how to pray in tongues, what I want you to do is speak directly the things that we, the prayer point that we want. What do you want to see in that prayer point? All right? What I want you to do, to do is feel free to move around this room and pray. All right? So when I'm in my prayer room, my God, I love it. I don't want anything to be there. I don't want hindrance. My, I, I, I sometimes put some chairs there. My wife will pack it up for me good. And I say, that's good. Thank you for doing that in case I fall asleep. Because sometimes when I pray, I close my eyes and I don't know what's there. And I just pray. And so what I want to tell you is this. We're going to pray as a church. There is three prayer points that I want us to pray as a church. One prayer point, I want us to pray for this church. Amen? I want us to stand up. 